Mr. Speaker, my phone decided to stop. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to stand up today and uh, join my uh, honourable colleague from North uh, Okanagan, Shuswap, and uh, talking about uh, Oceans Act and Canadian Petroleum Resources Act. And uh, the title somewhat bothers me, and I'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, my honourable friend from uh, North Okanagan, Shuswap, is very compassionate about fishing interior waters and uh, coastal waters in British Columbia and, and I have talked to him many times and I, I believe he's, he's quite an expert on that, much more so than I am. But my interests and my heart lies in some of the points in this Bill C-55 and that's dealing with consultation with the Aboriginal community, uh, communities, businesses, etc. The stakeholders, of course. Mr. Speaker, I sat on the Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. And last year, our committee presented a report taking action today, establishing protected areas for Canada's future. I believe it was an excellent report. All parties on that uh, committee worked very well. And I have to uh, commend our chair, the honourable member from King Vaughan, who, uh, who led us to prepare that unanimous report that was sent to government. And I see government has jumped on parts of that bill and established that into C-55. You know, when we were doing that report, we heard uh, from people from coast to coast to coast. We heard from a large number of Aboriginal communities from the West Coast, Inuits from the Arctic, Aboriginals from the interior of Canada, Aboriginal communities from the East Coast, the James Bay area. And they had one specific message that they sent to us, consultation. I see this is somewhat missed in Bill C-55. I noted in the minister's uh, mandate letter that states the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans instructs him to work with the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to increase the proportion of Canada's marine and coastal areas that are protected to 5% by 2017 and 10% by 2020, and it says it's going to support it by new investments in community consultation and science. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's look at that number. That's, that's three months from now. They're going to reach 5%. As of about June of this year, Mr. Speaker, I think Canada was less than 1% of coastal areas and protected spaces. And we were only at about 11% uh, for inland protected spaces and inland water protected spaces. So we're going to go from 1% to 5%. But let's look back on the history of this, uh, where these numbers came from. And it came from the HE agreement that came out of the Convention on Biological Diversity that was held back in 2010. Our Conservative government attended that conference and we agreed with many other nations around the world to establish protected spaces both inland and on our coastal waters. And we agreed on 10% of coastal waters to be protected by 2020 and 17% of inland water and lakes to be protected by 2017. But also, we looked at it as a government. Those are aspirational targets. Could we reach them? No. Not without doing proper consultation with our Aboriginal communities, our municipalities, our provinces, industry stakeholders. It was going to take a great amount of time 
and it was going to take a lot of work. But we looked at those targets and we agreed to those targets and we think that they can be reached. There's a large segment out there, Mr. Speaker, of environmentalists that think that we should go much higher. In fact, during our uh, committee's work, there were people that made presentations that think 50% of Canada's coastal waters should be protected. 50% of the inland should be protected. Those unrealistic amounts. I noticed that it also stated in the mandate letter that since the designation of the marine protected areas, MPAs, can take several years, the Liberal World government is introducing through Bill C-55 an interim designation of significant or sensitive areas identified by scientists and through consultation with Indigenous people, local communities and other interested groups. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to read part of the report that was submitted by our committee, which, as I stated, was unanimous, and it states, federal protected areas account for about 45% terrestrial and 83% marine of Canada's total protected areas. Accordingly, that's where we're at, but that's not the 17% or the 10%. Accordingly, collaboration action by all levels of government, including indigenous governments, landowners, industrial stakeholders, and civil society is required to resolve issues of competing use for land and water in order to achieve and exceed our targets. Protected areas in the Arctic marine and boreal regions are of particular importance. So that's what the committee had proposed and sent forward to the government. But the government, in its usual format of consultation, Mr. Speaker, has said, we're going to only listen to identified scientists. They're going to pick the areas because we're going to do this really quick. We've got three months to do it all of a sudden. They're going to pick up 5% of our coastal waterways and they're going to protect them because the scientists are going to pick it. But I thought throughout our report that we really talked about working with Indigenous people, talking with Indigenous pe people, talking with stakeholders, talking with municipalities, etc. That's not being done. What the Liberals are saying, well, not saying, they're dictating. You know, we dictating this, our scientists are going to tell you what land we're taking, and you're going to listen, and then we'll have some consultations so we can say we had consultations after the fact. After the fact, Mr. Speaker, that's not what the report stated. It stated to have active consultation with all stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, I want to read another part of the report. The federal government has a variety of roles to play to meet our targets. It must provide the leadership needed to ensure coherent and coordinated plans are developed to reach the targets. It must partner with Indigenous people to establish and recognize new types of protected areas in Indigenous territories while providing new opportunities for Indigenous economic development and advancing reconciliation. The federal government must also put its own house in order by coordinating its efforts, accelerating the establishment of federal protected areas, and demonstrating political will, including through the provisions of funding. Now, they do say that somewhat in Bill uh, C-55, and yes, we did recommend in Bill C-55 that we speed things up. But Mr. Speaker, to move to 5% in three months, by dictating the areas first, then starting consultation after, is not what the Standing Committee reported to government to do after li li listening sorry, to a number of witnesses across this country. So again, a broken promise. They don't even want to listen to their own members on the committee. They just want to do as they see fit 
and expect the people to follow suit. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go to another area of this report. Bear with me, Mr. Speaker. There's lots of reading here. One of the recommendations, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the first, the first recommendation by the committee that studied this only a year ago was that a national stakeholder advisory group to advise the cons conservation body to be established representing, among others, municipal governments, civil society, private landowners, conservation specialists, industry, academics, and Indigenous groups, and that a process be put in place to which individuals, in particular Indigenous people or organizations, may suggest priority areas for protection. That was number one recommendation, Mr. Speaker. Now let's go back to what the Liberals are stating in Bill C-55. The Liberal government has introduced Bill C-55, which will allow for an interim designation of significant or sensitive areas identified by scientists. Where in there did it say scientists? It says academics. It says Aboriginal groups. It said stakeholders. It didn't say scientists. I'm not knocking scientists. Science is needed to establish these areas. But they have gone completely, totally against a standing committee that made very strong recommendations. Those recommendations were made on the information received from Aboriginal people from coast to coast to coast, from stakeholders from coast to coast to coast. But again, it's not in the interest of the Liberals to follow the recommendations that were put out by the committee. They're just going to do as they see fit. Now, also reading part of that statement I mentioned earlier that it kind of bothered me Canadian Petroleum Resources Act to be thrown in C-55. Why focus on oil and gas? It appears over the last little while, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberals are attempting any which way they can to stop future oil and gas development in Canada. I want to read recommendation one again, Mr. Speaker. And it states in there, I'm going to change my train there for a second, Mr. Speaker. Bear with me, please. Thank you. Again, it says the federal protected areas account. I'm sorry, the federal government has a variety of roles to play to meet our targets. And it is not one specific target get rid of the oil and gas sector in Canada. And all we have to see, if we go from the last three or four months or the last year, is that they want to change probably the strongest regulatory controls in the world held by uh, National Energy Board, by the Alberta Energy Board, by the BC Energy Board. We've had much scientific evidence that shows that these are the best anywhere, and yet it's not good enough for this government. They're going to come on up with new forms of stopping oil and gas industry. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to read recommendation number 22 that's in this report. And again, I'll just uh, advise you what report that is, and that's the report uh, talking, uh, taking action today, establishing protected areas for Canada's future. Just in case you may have forgotten. The committee, in recommendation, recommendation number 22, the committee recommends that the government of Canada place a priority on collaborating with Indigenous people northern governments and stakeholders to protect the highest ecological value of Arctic waters and for traditional use in future generations. 
Now, is this being done? No. They're putting scientific evidence in there. They're telling them what areas they're going to pick. They're then going to consult with them and basically tell them that this is what you end up with. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to read a further part of the report, and, it, uh, and I'm going to read uh, page two of the report. And it talks about the recommendations include accelerating the establishment of national parks, national marine conservation areas, migratory bird sanctions, national wildlife areas, marine protected areas, and other federally protected areas by establishing multiple protected areas concurrently, ensuring that no federal policy or legislation such as the Mineral and Energy Resource Assessment and the Canadian Petroleum Resource Act slows the process of establishing protected areas. Now, the committee didn't say to get rid of that act, but they're saying it in Bill C-55, Mr. Speaker. And why did they uh, just pick on the Canadian Petroleum Resource Act, and why didn't they uh, talk about the Energy, energy Resource Assessments? Or any of those others? No, they're just going after the oil and gas sector, Mr. Speaker. And it further states, helping to coordinate the establishment of networks of protected areas. And this is what the committee says, creating a federal protected area system plan that incorporates not just national parks, but all federal protected areas, terrestrial and marine, creating a mechanism for federal, provincial, municipal, indigenous cooperation and encouraging public participation in the establishment of protected areas and leading science-based assessments towards identifying protected areas and stuff like that. But using science to help establish. But using science, Mr. Speaker, again, using science to help after we go through the consultation periods, we meet with industry, we meet with the stakeholders, we meet with the indigenous groups, and we work together, united, Canadians, to come up with the areas that we should be taking as protected spaces. Now, Mr. Speaker, I just want to read a quote from a witness that appeared before the Fishings and Oceans Committee recently. And that was uh, Sean Cox, professor of Simon Fraser University, quite a lead expert in marine life, stuff like that. And this is what he has to say, Mr. Speaker. Looking at some of the previous testimony, there was a claim that there was overwhelming scientific proof that MPAs are beneficial and widely successful. I think that was misrepresentation of the actual science. He goes on to say, just enforcing MPAs would be hugely expensive. Again, if you're looking at it from the fisheries management point of view, it's far more cost effective to do other things that don't cost that much. MPAs are likely to be effective scientific tools either. That aren't likely to be scientific tools, Mr. Speaker. They're not easily replicated. When you put in an MPA, it's subject to a high degree of what we call location and time effects. You can't just create a nice experiment where you have three of the same type of MPAs in one place and then three control areas in another. You just can't do that. They're wide open to outside perpetuations, environmental changes, and they are not within our control. If you want to build on the process of trust and goodwill, you don't then ignore what your stakeholders have to say. And again, I want to stress that. You don't then ignore what your stakeholders have to say and consult only a minority of the protected areas that were being recommended. And this is what's happening with Bill C-55. They're going to tell the Aboriginal communities, they're going to tell the stakeholders, these are the areas we picked. Now we can sit down and talk about that. Is that proper consultation? No. And it's a completely opposite direction that our report asked them to do. Mr. Speaker, he goes on to say, as soon as you do that, you no longer have a network of protected areas. So it begs the question, 
why you went to such elaborate lengths to put together these design criteria if in the end all you're going to do was cherry pick a few sites. That is what's happening with Bill C-55. They're cherry picking a few sites. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires, the Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I'm glad the member brought up Indigenous communities because we know that with marine protected areas that it's often Indigenous people that will be, you know, looking out for those areas that are, uh, for thousands of years, have been uh, taking care of those uh, communities where the MPAs are located. Um, this government, uh, the Liberal government in the past a year ago, they made a promise that they were going to invest in marine training and equipment, uh, supplies, support for coastal communities in British Columbia so that they could be equipped to look after communities. Because we know it's local knowledge that they have of these communities and they're, they're the ones that are on the water, that are out there saving lives. But when there's an incident that might threaten one of these marine, marine, marine protected areas, it's going to be Indigenous coastal communities, very likely, like it was in Hartley Bay when the Queen of the North went down, like when lives were saved, when the Leviathan sank off of Tofino or the Simishura, when it was uh, floating adrift off of the Queen Charlotte's. Does the member support investments in marine training and does he see it as an urgent need because he talked about consulting with uh, uh, indigenous communities i was just at the new challenge tribal council meeting on monday and they identified this as an issue because they they were given all these promises a year ago by this government and they've seen nothing delivered to them they feel betrayed they're concerned they're fulfilling a role that uh, as great Canadians do of looking out for each other and looking out for our precious ecosystems but they've gotten nothing so far so will the member maybe speak if he is in support of resources getting to those indigenous communities I was talking to uh, you know Al Dick who's on the housing emergency uh, response team and he says you know uh, to me he's saying where is that help that was promised when are we going to get support you know, it's those those communities and those people that are that you know get out there, they save lives and they protect the ecosystems without even thinking about it. So I hope the member maybe can speak about the importance of Indigenous people being resourced so that they can look after those marine protected areas when they get established. The honourable member for Yellowhead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my uh, the honourable friend for that uh, great question and. Uh, I totally agree that we need to work with the Aboriginal communities. We need to fund Aboriginal communities, wherever it be, whether it's the West Coast, the East Coast, the Arctic. They are the true keepers of the land. They know through traditional history what has taken place, what may take place, and they are better equipped than any government body or organization to do such a thing. We heard from many groups from the West Coast when we toured there last summer, and we met with them and talked about expanding these protected areas. They very much want to be part of that, and our committee recommended that very strongly in our report, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we recommended that money be put forward and ensured that they are part of these protected spaces. I don't see that in Bill C-55. I see in Bill C-55 the government wants to dictate, the government wants to consult. I don't know how they're going to consult with everybody in three months, Mr. Speaker, but we need to take the time, we need to take the efforts, we need to meet with our Indigenous neighbours, when we make these new protected areas and they're picked, they should be picked with them in consultation, not with some scientists telling them, and then we should work together to come up with a plan on how they can manage them for the government. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for his speech. <clears throat> he has a clear advantage over me in that he is uh, part of the committee and part of the committee that wrote the report. And I was wondering whether I could get his comments on Section 35.2 of, um, of the bill, which says that the Governing Council and Ministers shall not use the lack 
of scientific certainty regarding the risks posed by any activity that may be carried out in certain areas of the sea as a reason to postpone or refrain from exercising their powers. And the powers, of course, is the power of designation or the power to repeal the designation. So I'm a little uh, concerned about just the uh, exact position of the Honourable Member and his party. Is it your view, therefore, that the government has erred in presenting this bill by um, saying that the lack of scientific certainty should not impede a designation? Or does his, is it his view that in order to have a designation or a repeal of a designation, uh, that there has to be absolute scientific certainty? The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for that question. I agree that science will play a very important role, and we cannot ignore science in the selection of protected marine spaces or protected inland spaces. But we need to use science in conjunction with strong consultation with our Aboriginal community. I think I'm just wasting my time. The member's not even listening, Mr. Speaker. He's having a better side conversation. and. Uh, if he wants an answer, I would like to give him an answer. I, I'm afraid that's the prerogative of the individual. Uh, you're, the time allotted to you is you, you have three minutes left to answer. Questions in Commons, the Honourable Member of North Okanagan, uh, Shuswap. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I uh, commend my colleague from Yellowhead um, on his knowledge on this, uh, recognize that he sat on the Environment Committee when they did a study on, uh, on parks and also marine protected areas. And I was just wondering if he would like to comment on uh, how, unlike terrestrial parks, that marine protected areas, the, the environment is constantly changing. Uh, ocean currents change, uh, feed sources change, water temperatures change. How can we uh, compare that to the terrestrial parks where the boundaries are basically fixed. Um, the fish won't see the, the lines in the water, nor will the currents rec uh, recognize the lines in the water. Um, should they be uh, fixed, delineated areas, or would we be possibly better with stronger uh, um, measurements over fishing activities and other activities individually rather than being so focused on drawing, drawing a line on a map to meet an arbor, arbitrary target. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my uh, Honourable Friend for that question. I believe that uh, we need to really take into consideration, and again, I will go back to the consultation with our Aboriginal uh, neighbours. Um, they understand our coastal waters probably better than anyone. They've been there longer than anyone. They have fished those waters longer than anyone. They have seen the trends of Mother Nature changing. They have seen the temperature changes. They have seen the fish, fish move from one area to another, maybe come back. We see that inland with such things as the caribou moving and uh, going. Who understands this best are the Aboriginal people. So we need to work with them when we come up with these areas. They have to be a very important part. Science has to be a very important part. But I don't know if we can put strict boundaries and say this is where it starts and this is where it ends because it's going to be difficult even for the government to exactly know what their boundaries are. It's going to be very difficult for people to know whether they're in a protected zone or not. Uh, I think we need to be very realistic in the way we go about doing that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We have time for a very, very brief question for 30 seconds. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I have a lot more to say than 30 seconds will take me, so I'll just ask a really simple question. You know, during the Conservatives' time in government, there was a commitment made, and I think across my riding in North Island Powell River that's right on the ocean, um, we wanted to see some commitment to protecting the oceans. And so if you look at the reality that the U.S. has over 30 percent of their oceans protected, we're just talking about 5 percent to 2017 and 10 percent to 2020. 
Why was this last government not taking any steps to make that a reality? In 30 seconds or less, the Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think our government did uh, do a lot. Maybe we didn't accomplish what the Honourable Friend wanted down there, but let's look at some of the stuff we did. Additional measures include the protection of MPAs under the Oceans Act, uh, the Musqua Estuary in New Brunswick, the Bowie Seamont off the coast of British Columbia, Ontarium uh, Neruda off the Beaufort Sea. So these are just some of the areas that we went into protected spaces. So, so we were busy, but it takes time. Thank you.